we've been dealing with programming aspects of networks as a whole. Specific to telecommunication networks, uh, it would be important to understand the historical perspective of it and how the telecom networks, as in NGN, start becoming more programmable. So we'd look at the programmability aspects from uh, the need and the rise of the advanced uh, intelligent networks. 1996, uh, Telecom Act was the watershed moment uh, when uh, the US government decided to deregulate telecommunication to invite open competition. While this was uh, attractive for other participants and new competitors, it opened up some challenges for the existing vendors and the service providers because now they had to compete more for product differentiation. The level of granularity and sophistication which was expected was uh, on ever increasing rise. Uh, the flexibility from the user perspective had to be uh, provisioned and uh, most of all uh, the speed of deployment and service provisioning was a concern. This is a quick timeline starting from early 60s to late 90s. Here we see that uh, the adoption of uh, digital telephony in Telecommunication started somewhere in 60s, and then uh, we see um, the evolution of AT&T uh, as a service provider to uh, enter into data networks for voice-based uh, uh, circuit switched, virtual circuit switched networks. Then we saw the intelligent networks to be emerging somewhere around 80s, uh, where the um, service logic for the hardware and in telecom networks uh, was separated for the switching uh, fabric. Then uh, there are some projects like Columbia Open Programmable Networks. This became a precursor uh, to uh, XBind that became almost a standard. Uh, we see uh, AT&T Geoplex um, to have Java-based uh, middleware for IP networks. Then uh, DARPA Active Networks, um, it's a very well-known uh, um, domain that was the precursor to software-defined networking. Moving on, uh, we see in uh, late 90s, we see Megaco. Uh, that is almost a de facto standard for gateway control architecture. It was jointly proposed by uh, the Telecom Union and the uh, Internet Engineering Task Force. So with this, let's look at the need to have a programmable network. First and foremost, we must identify uh, the need for having an independent infrastructure that takes into consideration the programmability. Then how exactly would that network be configured, the different modes of it? From the telecom perspective, we know that we have uh, user equipment, which is in customer premises, and we when, then we have the network elements which are residing in the operator um, premises. For that, if we want to have a distinction on the programming aspect, we need to think about providing some kind of interfaces. So the user to network interface is what is provisioned to the user end and the network to network interface is what is there for the telcos and the um, vendors and the operators. The call processing at the basic switch was the uh, turning point or the starting point for uh, uh, move towards uh, advanced uh, intelligent network. We understand that uh, in a typical switching fabric, the uh, opening and closing of connection points, let's say in a, in a Banyan network or in a crossbar switch, uh, is what switching is all about. Uh, usually, uh, we see it in terms of uh, the make or break circuits. But uh, if it is implemented through uh, an in-band signaling mechanism, uh, then we are now looking at some kind of programmability of a switch where a call has uh, data, which is actually in-band carrying signaling information regarding the address. Uh, the example of it is uh, sig signaling standard number seven, uh, which is a common channel signaling. Um, now, this SS7, became so widely prevalent for switching fabrics that uh, it, it has been adopted and is still widely used in, uh, in, uh, in mobile communications. 
the signaling if it can work for a single switch or it can work for multiple switches on uh, multiple simultaneous, simultaneous calls. And this makes the uh, overall uh, usage of the switching fabric uh, more uh, scalable. Let's look at the example. Here we see a, a switching fabric, um, the uh, crossbar uh, where we have the incoming lines and the outgoing lines. Uh, the calls are uh, um, uh, being routed inside the switching fabric um, uh, through a certain number of input lines. Each input line has a call. So this particular call is carrying the signaling information as well. So this signaling information is passed to a central entity like a, like a microprocessor that processes the intelligence within these uh, in-band uh, signals. And depending upon that, uh, is sending out signals to each of these nodal elements to either cross or to bar, that is to disconnect or to connect. Now this uh, intelligent switching uh, is good if it is in-band. But if we have an outer band signaling mechanism like SS7, it can certainly uh, improve the overall efficiency of the system. Now, this is what we uh, have uh, had in the beginning. If we generalize it, we can think about having some APIs, the application programming interfaces, which are provisioned or offered as open services uh, to the users. So we have the uh, service AP APIs for the users, uh, which in turn are managing or requesting the control elements. Control elements are switches or the routers, um, which in turn are connected uh, to the forwarding elements using the network to network interface. So the controlling elements are the call processing intelligence entity, which in turn uh, configure uh, the forwarding elements. Now this might be appearing as something which is quite familiar because this is the precursor of uh, the uh, software-defined networking. Now, let's look at a typical PSTN exchange. Um, a PSTN exchange actually uh, takes calls from the users and directs them to appropriate destinations or to another exchange. Uh, here, uh, if we uh, break down a PSTN exchange, we can think about the intelligence part, that is the service, control point which is the intelligence part then the service switching points or the switching fabric or the um, uh, crossbar network now when there is a signal which is there on the input line it's going to be there on the uh, on the uh, switches so uh, upon receiving such in band signal uh, the service switching point is going to share this uh, information with service control point. The service control point retrieves the, um, the data structure uh, or the um, header information uh, and uh, retrieves respective uh, database record uh, and executes it and then subsequently directs the SSP for further processing. Uh, this is how we look at uh, the typical network element that is a switch. Or, a, or an exchange to be now comprising the uh, service control point and the service switching point. And these are connected through the intelligent network access point that provides the service control point to uh, enforce a certain policy onto the service switching point. The services could be uh, routing, inter interactive voice response, a basic toll free number like 800. Uh, the uh, calling card service, which is the scratch card payment cards, uh, which are used for making calls uh, by getting such cards off the shelf. Then uh, private virtual networks, where the caller and callee wish to establish a secure connection. And if these uh, parameters of a caller are not satisfactory, a call even could be turned down. Now, it's a classic paper, uh, Programming Telecom Networks, from 1997, uh, Aurel Lazar from Columbia University uh, proposed or put up certain ideas for programmability back in 1997 for telecom networks. And again, he is one of the co-authors for a 
2021 paper published in IEEE Communication Service in Tutorials. I guess he's the fourth fourth author. The origin and evolution of open programmable networks and SDNs. So this is where the data networks and the telecom networks are converged. So it, these are very good reads uh, for subsequent uh, in detail understanding of the same concepts that I've briefly explained.